So uh, happy to join you. My name is Iran. I'm gonna add Mike now so we can uh, say hello and uh, hey there, Mike. How are you hey. doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Yes. What aim is that for you? Uh, what time is it? It's four o'clock here in the afternoon here in Sydney. Ah, nice. How's the weather? It's actually been a really beautiful day. Not a cloud in the sky. Uh, the sun's just about to start setting. Awesome. Well, are you ready for your talk? I sure am. Yeah, very excited. All right, let's get you at it. Uh, there we go. Should see your screen now, and you are off to go. Awesome. Good luck, Mike. Thanks very much. Okay, so it's great to be here with you all. Um, very excited. I uh, yeah, going to be talking to you about the biggest security talent pool that you've never heard of. Uh, although some of you might have heard of it before, if you have. I hope you'll learn something today from what I've got to share. So this is a bit of an unusual talk at a, um, a DevSecOps, DevSecCon event. Uh, I'm not going to be getting into any tactical, any kind of technical areas, but I'm looking at a really broad sort of strategic level about uh, some of the personnel that you might be missing out on, some of the people that could be adding a lot to your company um, over the coming weeks and months. So let's see if my slides work on to slide two. So yeah, a bit about me. I'm the founder and CEO of Exceptional, uh, which is a technology matching platform connecting autistic job seekers with businesses that need top talent. And uh, this business was really inspired by my sister, Sarah. Now she is on the autism spectrum, uh, has some amazing strengths, uh, is a real uh, talent when it comes to singing, uh, really into music. Um, but I've watched her for a whole working age. She recently turned a few years ago 40, so she's had over 20 years of, of that period of working life when she struggled to find and keep work. And there was a moment about now three years ago when uh, she was working as a cleaner, and uh, she was, through that shift, following instructions very, very literally. Um, and yet, uh, after that, that moment, uh, she was actually let go from that position. The employer didn't take the time to understand her and understand that she takes instructions very, very literally and uh, end up letting her go. And that was really a uh, kind of tipping point for me, if you like. I'd seen that happen several times in, a, in her work and finally I decided I had enough. I wanted to start a company that showed you could really uh, utilize the strengths of someone like my sister and deploy them uh, as a business uh, opportunity if you like, and the idea for Exceptional was born out of that moment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you a bit about this talent pool, and then I'm gonna give you some specific examples of people that have excelled in companies that are employing in that area. And finally, I'm gonna give you some practical tips of what you can do uh, to bring about some change. So firstly, what is this talent pool? Well, some of the people in it that come to, come to us, come to me, often have double degrees, often in two different areas, in adjacent areas, uh, which uh, makes them quite broad, but also in the area where those two degrees overlap, there's a real niche, a new understanding that's often developed. Uh, and yet a number of people that are, have these double degrees end up uh, working as bus drivers, delivering groceries. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that that's not a good career to have. In fact, one of the angel investors of Exceptional is a bus driver um, as one of his many uh, careers. Um, but for these individuals that I'm referring to, this was for them not what they wanted to be doing and they were not able to get into the technology jobs uh, that their degrees were pushing them towards um, for various reasons that I will get into. So this pool, uh, alongside those that have degrees and double degrees, there's also people that are self-taught who learn from home, online learning, um, and up to a few years ago, that was really looked down upon. Now more and more companies are willing to accept people uh, that are, that are um, self-taught, that have done that sort of online learning versus uh, more traditional ways of educating. So things are starting to change for this group. One of the reasons that they struggle to get in is challenges with interviewing. Poor interview technique, or in fact, I'm now starting to see it as uh, deficits from the interviewers who are not understanding these particular candidates. The other strengths that they have include being really loyal to employers, being really hyper-focused on solving problems and getting to the bottom of issues, 
being really, really precise um, and being amazing at learning and improving themselves as they go. And yet, in some cases, varies across different countries, but too often they are 12 times less likely to be employed, which is, as you can imagine, a real big challenge for them. One of the individuals in this talent pool, probably the most famous, is Anthony Hopkins, the actor. And he was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum in his 70s, quite late in his career. And he said that that actually explained some of the, um, the intricacies, some of the ways he was so good at acting and also helped him understand some of the ways he goes about getting deep into the characters that he um, understands. So this talent pool that I'm talking about is the group of people on the autism spectrum, autistic people. And according to the CDC in the US, they number 125 million globally. That's based on a prevalence of one in 59, uh, although yeah, other countries vary slightly, they're often around that mark. Uh, so we may find it might be slightly more, slightly less as the years go on, uh, but it does seem to be, as we deepen our understanding of autistic people and the condition, then uh, actually the number seems to be going up. In Australia, where we're based, there are around 350,000 people, and 76 million across Asia. Uh, the UK Autistic Society did an assessment of their members, and they deduced that around 10% have an interest in or skills for uh, the tech industry. So we take that broad number as being uh, the group that we're focusing on, although we're just beginning to step outside of, beyond placing people purely in tech roles into other areas as well. And so if you take that 10% figure, apply it to 125 million, you get 12 and a half million. And then that's all people. So just under half are of working age. These are very, very broad statistics applied on a global level, but it gives you an approximate picture. That we're talking around 6 million people. On the other hand, I constantly hear from people in the security world that there's a gap in talent. And there's disagreements about how much, and you know when that agree when that gap is kind of peaking, um, you know I just heard a recent report from uh, one firm analysing leaders across the tech industry that said seventy eight percent of leaders say that they can't find enough people in the, the security field. Uh, one projection is for there being a gap of three and a half million globally. There's different debates about about where it is, but it's generally agreed. It seems to me to be in the order of a million, the millions. Um, and what we're seeing that as coming alongside the six million people I just talked about, this three and a half million talent gap, and we're coming together and connecting the two uh, with a proven process that works. And we're definitely not saying that, you know, all autistic people should be in cybersecurity. There's definitely other areas that I'm, I'm looking in. In fact, we think autistic people, the ones that, that we know are giving us a glimpse that they can do anything that they put their minds to. But what we're seeing in cyber is an incredible lining up with some of the strengths that we keep seeing across this group. And we keep hearing of people that are really um, excelling as well. Now, autistic people sits within a broader uh, sphere of neurodiversity. Now, what is neurodiversity is a collection of conditions uh, that affect the brain, neurological conditions, that have both challenges and strengths. So you'll see on there, uh, autism is one of those. Others include ADHD, uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, other things some of you may have heard of, some of, may not be, say, some of them may be new to you, um, but what we're beginning to realize is the, that the commonalities between these with autism is that they often present barriers to getting work, but when people get work, they often present really, really unique skills You'll see on this slide, um, the, the lines, the phrases underneath each condition are some of the strengths in those areas. And for exceptional, we started focusing on autistic people, and we, now we've begun to expand to uh, provide services to help other neurodiverse people get work. And we're starting to realize what a um, yeah, massive uh, group this is. In fact, uh, some experts believe it numbers one billion. One in seven people on the planet uh, fit in this group. 17% uh, when you add them all up together. And uh, yeah, let's just stop and think about that number for a moment. Imagine if 
you're someone that is hiring or your team is hiring someone new, imagine if you were unintentionally discounting a billion people from that job, um, some of whom could potentially be the best people for that job. And that's a really uh, shocking thing and something that is worth uh, changing your recruitment, changing your, your workplace um, in, in small but um, you know, ways that actually have an impact. So what are the strengths of this group? I've touched on some of them. And uh, yeah, I'll just go through a few specific examples. One is a real uh, ability for deep focus. Uh, you know, some of the people I've met in the, in the security world tell me that often when there's a, on a major system when there's a real big problem and some um, vulnerability has been discovered, you've got to lock the doors and, and not leave uh, until it's solved. And I've heard of examples of that being multiple days. You know, our talent pool have an amazing ability to focus on, on that sort of time frame and really just keep going until the problem is solved. Uh, secondly, they can be amazing at problem solving, getting to the bottom, not just faster, as it says here, but also more creatively, thinking outside the box. JP Morgan have an autism hiring program in the US that they've ex since expanded to more than 10 countries. Uh, and if a, a bank does something, in multiple countries, then they must believe that it's really impacting their bottom line. And with their Autism at Work program, they deduced that the employees were 48% faster and 92% more productive. And yeah, often the people we work with have a superior memory, ability to recall facts and processes, ways of doing things. Uh, so it could be, you know, someone working on a system recalls a vulnerability that they saw on a, on a past system that mirrors this one, you know, five, 10 years ago, and remembers that and can apply it here. That memory also means that individuals have a real ability to get into a niche topic, understand an area in real detail that makes them um, often real uh, subject matter experts. What fascinates me is that in the medical field, they used to see that kind of niche interest area as a negative. You know, people are getting too narrow into one particular area. But actually nowadays, it's seen as a positive that people are focusing on something in such detail that they're the person you go to when you want to solve that problem. They're the person you go to when you want to get a real deep understanding of how to uh, prevent problems coming up in that area. And so fourthly, a real attention to detail, ability to, to spot patterns in data. I mean, one of the people that we placed at a bank you know, on day one, she could see ways that systems could be improved um, and that some of the current systems were, you know, adding in, uh, you know, making people lose time because of the way they're doing things. And she saw that because of her ability to look at patterns and look at systems and, and see that detail that others missed. Uh, and finally, that high integrity. The people that we work with really stick it out with their employers. And there's a real high retention rate um, as people, um, yeah, really, really continue on in the work that they, they're doing. They want to do that well and stick uh, with their employers, something that a lot of people are looking for today. So I'll give you a few, three examples of people that I know or I've met who are autistic and really doing amazing work. The first one is Temple Grandin. And she's a lady that I had the privilege of meeting last year in, when she came out to Melbourne in Australia. And uh, yeah, Temple is working in the animal husbandry industry. So it doesn't sound directly relevant to cybersecurity, but I'll get there, give me a moment. This is a uh, drawing that she did early on in her career. And this is a drawing of a cattle dip that cows go through when they're being cleaned. And you'll see it's circular. And what she did, she spent hours observing cattle in fields and noted that when they were calm, they walked in circles. And when they were upset, they would stampede and they'd run in a straight line. And the traditional cattle dips were in straight lines. And so every now and then, one of the cattle would get upset um, and they would bolt into the water. And often, sadly, they would drown. And then they'd have to stop the whole process uh, and to get that cattle out, often for several hours to sort things out, particularly if the machinery got broken um, or if several cattle were affected. And Temple realized if you put the dip in a circle, then that would calm the cattle. They would think that they were in a more um, calmer situation walking around in those circles. 
And second thing she did, you'll see the sides are kind of quite straight. Uh, those are the walls. Um, and in the past, they would have fences that would have you know, gaps between them like this. And the color would look through the gaps and they might see a car or a reflection in a mirror or somebody's red clothing, a red t-shirt. And they would get upset and then that would also cause them to bolt. So what she did is she put walls that were um, solid, you know, had no gaps in them. And uh, all these things added up to mean that uh, the cattle, uh, the process was better for the farmers. In fact, uh, there's a, a fantastic Claire Danes movie made about Temple's life. And uh, yeah, at the moment uh, Claire Danes portrays, Temple said that Temple, uh, that Claire Danes really portrayed this moment well when she went into the owner of the rancher's office and said, you've got to, You've got to follow my uh, suggestions. Um, otherwise, you'll be losing hours on the production. And you can see this moment when he realizes uh, this person's really onto something that's going to have a positive impact on the business. And uh, yeah, although this seems to be not a cybersecurity connected thing, I'm not suggesting that Temple should work in cybersecurity. But for me, this shows that she saw a kind of vulnerability, a risk in the system, and took steps to using her unique insight uh, to really get rid of that. Um, and I, we see that applying to, um, to security, to AppSec, where the people they're working with often have that ability to think outside the box and to voice their, their ideas and to be really frank with the ways that they can see systems that should be perhaps changing to be uh, more curved than they are currently straight. Uh, the second example of someone I want to tell you about is Anthony. Now, he came to us. Uh, now about two years ago, and uh, at the time he was really struggling with interviews, despite himself having multiple degrees, uh, and he, including a PhD in physics, and he told me he didn't think he would ever get a job in a company that was a household name. And so we put him through our customized interview process where we get people to show their strengths, um, to play games, do puzzles, to really understand how their brains think. And I remember Anthony was going through this activity called the Triangle Program, which is a pretty simple piece of software that takes uh, three sides of a triangle uh, and three inputs, and it outputs the type of triangle. So let's say um, you input three, three, and three, the program will tell you that it's an equilateral triangle. You give it five, five, and one, it will tell you that it's a, an isosceles, um, and yeah, so on and so forth. And what Anthony did is he started asking questions like, um, actually clarifying questions. Does this apply also to 3D geometry? What about if you're mapping onto a sphere? And he said to me, Mike, you know, because uh, looking at triangles mapped on a sphere, they actually act quite differently. Um, and I just thought that was such an insightful way of thinking that I called over the hiring manager who was in the room. He came over, asked Anthony to explain his questioning uh, to the hiring manager. Um, and he was so blown away that Anthony ended up getting a job, ends up being deployed with one of the biggest banks in Australia, um, and has since been promoted as well. And uh, yeah, what fascinated me was how, uh, for Anthony, he was just asking clarifying questions based on his abilities and his knowledge in physics. Um, but for the hiring manager, it, it really showed him insights into how Anthony thinks that wouldn't come across in a traditional uh, interview. And the third person that I want to tell you about is Tim. And he came to us uh, via actually a TV show that was tracking job seekers in their, their job seeking journey. Um, and Tim came to us and one of the puzzles that we put to him in the interview process was a dice puzzle. Uh, and to, what we tend to do, actually when we play it in um, person, I have the dice somewhere on my table, but I've, I've, I've put them away. Um, when we play in person, we'll roll the dice and we'll use a formula that the interviewer comes up with on the dice to come up with, with a result. And the person going through has to problem solve by thinking through what that formula might be, trying different uh, cases. Um, and you'll see, isn't, you know, often they will start with an example, like adding up the dice and then multiplying them, um, and then yeah, doing other, you know, adding two, subtracting one, uh, this one, all the top three answers come up with 13, uh, but the bottom one doesn't. So this one actually is a multiple of addition of the dice, and then one of them is being multiplied. 
uh, let me see from memory, I think it's six, and then adding on three times the middle dice, which is 15 minus two. Yeah, that gives 13. And then one plus multiple of three of the five is 16, minus three again is 13. Uh, so yeah, using that, you can deduce that, but you know, that's not quite how quickly I'm giving you the answer there, but when we do this game, then uh, yeah, we give hints, we give suggestions, and try and understand how an individual thinks, particularly someone going for a job in the tech uh, area where they need to apply mathematical skills, numerical thinking, problem solving. And uh, Tim was actually the first person that, that once he got this puzzle and, we, and the different ways we played it, he wanted to turn it back on me as the interviewer. He wanted to have a go at coming up with his own algorithm and quickly came up with ones that, that I couldn't work through. Um, but it was it really showed how well he got this activity. Um, and now, funnily enough, he's being deployed. In one, one of the thick client work that he's doing is working on um, an, an app for Exceptional to help us uh, pr provide this puzzle in, in interviews to people more broadly. Um, but there are many other companies like us, like the examples of Tim and Anthony, uh, that are deploying people who are neurodiverse in technology uh, and in cyber jobs in particular. Uh, one other example from this broad board, which um, really was relevant for the coronavirus time was Geosynergy on the right. They're a firm up in Brisbane, and we placed an individual with them who was several hundred miles uh, away, actually in a different state. And he was interviewed remotely, assessed remotely, put through these puzzles remotely from home, and now he's working remotely. In fact, he's never in person, as I understand, met his employer. Uh, they talk, they work over Slack. And uh, yeah, that happened actually back in January, just before coronavirus, and really got a lot of interest um, during this time. And you know, we did a survey of the people we work with, 92% of them would prefer to work all or part of their time from home. This is a group that sadly for too long have experienced, for years have experienced social, iso social isolation because of being locked out of the job market. And But now this presents an opportunity for them to get back into the workforce. Uh, another organization which has been for decades embracing neurodiversity is the GCHQ in London. Uh, the government communications department it says on their neurodiversity, on their diversity inclusion webpage, without neurodiversity, neurodiversity, we wouldn't be GCHQ. It's so fundamental to everything they do. Going back to the, the 1940s and 1950s, during the Second World War, they had code breakers um, who were neurodiverse, people that really thought differently. Um, and they've come to realize over the decades that they really need to support and hire from this group. And in fact, uh, now all their processes are very neurodiverse friendly. Um, and you know, particularly targeted at um, adding to this um, to their pool that are from this group. Another example of an organisation hiring in this space is the New South Wales government, where we're based in Australia. They are, in fact, the largest employer in the Southern Hemisphere. Four hundred thousand people uh, work for the New South Wales government. Uh, when you consider how many people are in the Southern Hemisphere, that is about one in two thousand. Uh, so actually a really significant employer. And this is uh, Gladys Spirogiklian, um and uh, Gareth Ward, the Minister for Disability. And they recently announced just in March that they are targeting an additional 10,000 people with disabilities that they want to hire to increase their percentage up to 5.6% by 2025. Uh, and they're really taking efforts to hire from, from this group. One thing that we're doing with them is one of their departments finding people uh, to work in their cybersecurity division. And uh, yeah, it's been interesting to see how they've gone. Initially, they wanted people of a certain skill level and experience, and then they started to realize that actually this is such a hard group, hard type of person to find, type of skill that they became more flexible, willing to take uh, people that were, um, had the propensity to work and be trained up in this field rather than having made a career in it already. Uh, in the UK, there's a network of organizations that are um, in the cybersecurity neurodiverse space. They formed a group to really learn from each other. Um, we're hoping that other 
other countries will will follow their lead. Uh, it's amazing to see how many see this as an important space. Uh, this chart really sums up for me the, the missed opportunity. You see on the right hand side, the that's the chart for people without disability and the, the population that are employed or the portion that are employed. On the left is the portion of people with disability. For people who are neurodiverse people, and for people who are artistic, autistic, the number is even less. Uh, some estimates put that down to 20% um, or even lower. And so, yeah, seeing those differences, it really is um, concerning both for the individuals but also for companies that are looking the top talent. Now, why is that? Well, there are some challenges, some I've touched upon, um, that prevent barriers that prevent people getting in. One is social isolation. Uh, sorry, social interaction. I've been using the word, the phrase social isolation so, so long, it's just slipping off my tongue in, in, unintentionally there. But in a sense, this group have experienced social isolation for too long. And that those interactions socially are challenging. And so an interview moment where you're thrown in a social situation with someone completely new and such high stakes is stressful for all of us, but particularly for people that experience high anxiety, um, it's even tougher. Recruitment processes are written in a really standardized way to accept you know, the most people, but they miss out people on the fringes. I had a fascinating step uh, report just last month that said that 35% uh, of CEOs surveyed in the UK are dyslexic, have dyslexia. Uh, one of them is Richard Branson. And so with that high proportion of people, it's surprising that uh, for you know, people who, with dyslexia being the CEOs, it's surprising that job, applying for a job starts with filling in a form, starts with putting down words on paper, which works for some people, many, but not all. Um, and I'm hoping other CEOs will see, see this disparity and help lead for, for change and more alternative paths of getting jobs. Uh, thirdly, challenges with communication, with expressing uh, those incredible things that are going on in someone's brain um, and getting them on paper is really hard. I can personally empathize with that. Uh, doing public speaking like this is a challenge for me. I had to, uh, doing my public policy degree at Harvard, I took no less than four courses on presenting, on telling stories, on public speaking because I saw it was an area that I found really hard. And so I can empathize with the people that we work with uh, who yeah, really struggle to articulate themselves in interviews. And the final part of that, uh, all these challenges add up to make for this long-term uh, social isolation of unemployment. Uh, and someone else that zeroed in on these challenges uh, is a chap called Rhett Greenhagen that's worked in the US military, uh, is autistic himself, and he did a survey of 290 uh, people uh, on the spectrum who are working in security. Um, and the first thing that stood out to me was, wow, he was able to find that many people working in this field. I don't think there's many other uh, fields that we're placing people in where we can quickly and easily find that many people uh, to complete a survey. Uh, it's partly a picture of how well connected he is, um, and, but also it shows you how many people in that group. And the two challenges he really zeroed in on there, the yellow and the blue uh, were the biggest two. Uh, one is that social connection I just mentioned. The yellow one, actually the biggest, is the sensory um, challenges. So um, yeah, things like, we'll get into this in a bit more detail, things like uh, the light. Right now I've got these bright fluorescent lights on so that you can see me. Often when we have a meetup for autistic people working in tech, we'll turn these off um, and yeah, it's lights can be uh, really frustrating. Also sounds as well, um, different social, different sensory um, noises and, and, and signals can really negatively impact some people in the workplace. So often this stage when I'm giving presentation, we will go for an exercise that's a little challenging to do right now, um, but one that helps you understand the concept of a sensory diet. And that is that all of us, like the way that we take in food and have different preferences for food, we all have a sensory diet. Ways that, uh, you know, things that get us excited, things that overwhelm us, and things that calm us down. And uh, yeah, for all of us, a lot of, all of us, we manage that quite naturally. Right now, I've got my legs crossed. You can't see um, below the table, but I do. 
and a lot of people when they're speaking on a panel will cross their legs or they'll cross their arms um, and that's actually giving them a kind of like a hug uh, it's kind of giving themselves that sensory input uh, to calm them down a lot of people do that subconsciously uh, but a lot of autistic people need additional help to address uh, sound and and other senses or oh, they need accommodations they need the, the lights turned off uh, smells not to be seen near the, co the coffee machine um, and yeah my sister who is on the on the spectrum who i mentioned she uh, really struggles with noises uh, and sarah one of the developers that we work with she struggles with coffee smell and so we just have to make sure that we're not um, none of us have our coffee lids off when we're in the office um, it's all right today because I'm sitting here um, on, on my own, socially isolating. Uh, but when we're uh, in the post-COVID time, you know, those things become, um, yeah, become particularly important again. So what are some of the things that you can do? I've mentioned some practical steps that we've done. Um, but what are specific barriers that you can remove in your workplace? You, know, you might be uh, a colleague of you, know, you might be part of a team you might be a manager you might be involved in recruitment you might be a ceo it depends on where you are in the company as to what you can do um, and you know, i've got a picture here of someone in a wheelchair generally we know what the bound uh, barriers are for people in a wheelchair you know adding in ramps making sure doorways are wide enough that they can fit through making sure that there are accessible bathrooms but for autistic and neurodiverse people the barriers are still being understood they're still um, we're still all learning about them, um, but there's still some things that we can learn and that can be changed right now. One of them is the job interview. So I mentioned some of the ways that we've changed job interviews to involve puzzles, and that's one of the biggest steps you can take. Think through this question. Are you assessing a person's skills or their ability to articulate those skills? You know, someone really thanked us for those puzzles we do. And they said, wow, finally someone that wants to understand my brain rather than getting me to talk about uh, my experience or lack of experience. Uh, so, yeah, how can you think through how your company um, does? You know, do you get people to talk or do you get them to do work sample tests? Do you get them to do work sample tests in a really stressful environment, you know, coding up on the whiteboard? Or do you allow them space to do that? Do you allow them to go home? and take those, those uh, exercises home. Um, and now, yeah, there are, there are challenges. Every company we talk to says, oh, we can't do this because we've got to do things for everybody. Um, and yet we encourage them to think, um, you know, this is a group that's currently being missed out because of the, the box, the lines that you've drawn. So how about we go around the lines for a process? Some companies are willing to do that. Um, and then they start to see the, the stars, the, the strengths of people that come through. Microsoft is a company that's really understood this well. They have a, a massive uh, neurodiverse program uh, for hiring people. And Jenny Leigh Flurry, uh, she said that they discovered for them the problem was the interview. And so they changed their approach to what the process should look like. They worked with a local group to bring candidates in for a week-long program. Uh, we offer teamwork and technical exercises and lots of training and they assess people as they're training them, they see how they learn how they step up and they get extra data and they you not may not be able to do a week long but even one or two days can help to slightly reduce the anxiety that someone feels in that kind of one hour stressful interview and um, it gets a longer set of data into individuals um, so the interview think about how you do the interview secondly look more broadly at recruitment. So that goes earlier than the job interview back to the job description. How is the job description uh, locking people out? Uh, one way is to be more clear in the job description about what are the exact requirements. You know, we had one investment bank in Sydney that said to us, oh, we've got to have candidates to have experience in, I think it was Power BI, some analytics platform. And they said, or another, they listed two. And we said to them, well, what about if someone's done a third or a fourth or a different one? Oh, that's fine too. Okay. So we adjusted it. And then we said to them, well, how long would it take to train someone in Power BI if they'd done none of these? Uh, they said, oh, about two days if the person was a real whiz in Excel. And uh, then we asked, well, what does being a whiz in Excel mean? Oh, pivot tables, 
you know, so it's asking these questions to get really clear. What is essential? What is a, you know, a nice to have that would put a candidate higher up the list and be really specific. And we find that this clarity actually works for all other types of groups that are uh, returning to the workforce, you know, people from overseas, uh, people, uh, working mothers returning to work, all different groups benefit from, from this clarity. And next, the third biggest thing is thinking about the, um, the sensory environment of the work. And this has really changed with people working from home because if you think about it, your home is probably the in sensory environment that is most best set up for you yourself. And the people you live with, probably the people that best understand your own sensory diet, your own sensory needs, how you work as a person. So yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why so many of our group enjoy working from home. Um, but if you are asking people to come into the office for all or part of their time, then think about the lighting, uh, the sounds, allowing people to wear noise canceling headphones, thinking about the smells of the, the bathrooms or the coffee machine, the food areas. I remember meeting the head of uh, engineering for Google in Sydney, and he said to me, it's all very well. I asked him advice about what Google's doing for interviews, and he said, that's great. We want your help there, but we also need help with the office environment. We want to make sure that it works. And so we've since done consulting work to help improve the Google office here in Sydney um, and have helped uh, them to take steps to improve things. And the amazing thing was one uh, autistic engineer uh, who works there, you know, said to me that he can't go in the, before the, we did that, he couldn't go in the canteen because it was so noisy. It was so such a sensorily stressful environment. And two of the non-autistic, you know, neurotypical people who were there, they said to us, actually, I really struggle with the Google canteen at the moment. Uh, I find it overwhelming too. So often what the steps that you take for this group will work, will improve life, improve work outcomes for uh, yeah, everyone you're working with. Uh, the one other acronym I want to really highlight there, ATP. Uh, I got this from um, a man that's made real pioneers with Walgreens in employing people with disabilities. He said, ask the person, you know, ask each individual what works for them. Um, and that's just, yeah, such simple but profound um, advice. And, uh, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. I'm getting to the end of my time. But the final thing that I suggest is make sure each individual is set up for the right support structure. You know, we like to think about a triangle of support. Uh, people outside the workplace, you know, a, a, a job coach, someone outside, um, and then two people inside the workplace that are really providing that support structure. You know, the manager of each individual is the person that has the most potential, that untapped potential to allow autistic people to enter and then really shine in the workforce. Um, but often you also need a buddy, someone else outside your immediate work to have sound ideas off and someone outside the company as well to provide that third leg of support. So yeah, these are some of the suggestions that, that I have. Um, and I'd love to you to reach out to me if you've got any questions. And also let me know of examples of success, um, examples that you know of uh, neurodiverse, or autistic people who are really shining um, and leading the way in uh, doing amazing things in their in their work. So yeah, thank you very much for for having me along. And uh, yeah, I think I will now open it up for questions if there are any to be asked. Hey, Mike, it was a great session. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I did love the uh, the real world stories, and you had quite a few as well. All of them with a great social impact. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, thank you. For sure. I, uh, now I always say, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, but it looks like you're taking this uh, <laughs> like 10 steps forward, you know, being uh, <laughs> doing that, you know, 24 seven for your job day to day. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. One question I do have is uh, like, how do people that are uh, neurodiverse find out about you? Like, is it is it an easy task to uh, for them like to find out about it or it's like a hard one because maybe they're like like you said like maybe a bit social distance so like they wouldn't know about it and you know they would probably be looking for those employment opportunities that you know thanks to your company at exceptional you can do that uh, yeah. but like how do you how do you find people like finding out about you 
Yeah, good question. I mean, our website is definitely one way people can find out about us. A lot of people that do come to us have heard through a friend. Uh, you know, they are, um, yeah, word of mouth is a real big, big way of sharing. Uh, you know, when they've had success with someone helping them get a job, they'll tell a friend and yes, that word of mouth, but yeah, we're on, um, on, we've got social media channels as well. Um, but yeah, our website would be our, my primary suggestion, which is, uh, I should say what it is. It's exceptional.io. Awesome. Well, I think this is kind of like all the time we have and, uh, for the questions today. So I'm going to thank you for, uh, so much for this talk and for, you know, making this social impact. Uh, so Mike Tozer from uh, Exceptional, if any of you uh, want to spread the word out or just go check it out, uh, go ahead. And thank you so awesome. much again. Thanks so much for having me. For sure. Have a great day.